Okay, we're getting some regeneration gain now. Definitely getting some regeneration gain by bringing the BFO to critical. So you guys might remember this little guy. This is the shortwave crystal set. Uh, one of my more popular videos. And, uh, you know, people are incredulous. You can't get shortwave on a crystal set. Well, once you've got a strong enough signal and you have a nice tuned antenna, you sure can do a shortwave on a crystal set. And uh, I think that uh, sometimes the simpler the project, the more apt people are to build it, to actually sit down and build a project. If it looks like it's something they can do, you start getting uh, printed circuit boards and proto boards and multiple transistors and they kind of turn off and I don't think I can take on that project. The other thing, um, sometimes people accuse me of building ugly and sometimes they accuse me of building too neatly. And uh, I don't want to be accused either way but I just build with what junk box parts I can find and I get the other parts online however I can. I look under the tables at Hamfest, as everybody else does, to try to find those hidden treasures. So, uh, let's talk about uh, building something ugly that could go along with the shortwave crystal set. Additionally, I'd like to, of course, put a BFO circuit in this to get some direct conversion and uh, maybe do a little bit of uh, CW and sideband demodulation with the crystal set. Now, in the last video, I used uh, my signal generator to do that. That's a little bit crude, and not everybody has a signal generator. So why don't we build a tunable oscillator, local oscillator, uh, for the crystal set. And now you're going to say, oh, now you're adding batteries. It's not the fun crystal set anymore. We can solve that by making the oscillator run on a solar cell. How's that? Is that going to satisfy? If we can use a solar cell for the BFO uh, for the crystal set, would that, uh, would that satisfy? I don't know. But let's build this thing ugly. And uh, I propose that we use... Uh, well, let me grab some parts. You guys need to see what an ugly oscillator uh, is going to look like. Something that VK3YE would build. Ooh, these are some seriously ugly parts. First of all, we start with a piece of wood that's already warped, okay? That's a good place to start with this uh, project. Plus, it's got a whole bunch of holes in it because it looks like I built something on this before. So we're starting out good and ugly. Um, I've got a battery holder here. That's just to get started. Um, we'll wind up a coil. We'll have some kind of a knob. Uh, you're going to have to get a tuning capacitor. So let's get that on order. And then just some chunks of metal. We're going to build a tunable oscillator that's going to inject into the crystal set and allow us to make a very crude direct conversion uh, shortwave receiver. A direct conversion receiver will allow you to pick up code signals, single sideband. We'll be able to do synchronous AM detection. Synchronous AM detection with our crystal set. So stand by. We're going to build an oscillator. Mike, you are taking that simple crystal radio and you're going to inject some BFO energy into it? Yeah, that's all we're doing. We're going to put a little bit of BFO energy on frequency and we're going to get a beat note out that's going to represent code or single sideband demodulation. Now remember, we can do this with a simple single diode type mixer or we could have a uh, a balanced arrangement of some kind. I think I did a, a balanced arrangement on one of my older videos. So that's all we're doing. We're making a simple direct conversion receiver. So you guys know about Ohm's law, right? You know, the current basically goes up as the resistance goes down. And, uh, you know, if you increase the voltage for a given resistor, you know the current will go up. And uh, there are some conditions, though, 
where when the voltage increases that the current in the circuit actually goes down. Now in order for something like that to happen we have to have negative resistance. That's right, we're actually going to break Ohm's law. Only on this channel do we break Ohm's law, by the way. Don't call the kilocycle cops on me. I'm about to break Ohm's law. Okay, so the type of oscillator that I've decided to use was inspired by Costas and uh, he told me I had to do this circuit. I had no choice. I've got to, I've got to build a, uh, an oscillator uh, called the Franklin. No, not that Franklin. This Franklin. And this Franklin oscillator uses negative resistance. So I think we need to talk about that a little more. Let's, let's get that term under our belts so that we understand what we're doing with this oscillator. Remember, up to now, We've always been thinking of overcoming the losses in the circuit and having a gain greater than one to meet the Barkhausen effect and to get oscillation in a lossy tuned circuit. So let's see if there's an alternate way of taking the losses away from the tuned circuit and perturbing oscillation through negative resistance. So there's a lot of magic and hand-waving that goes on when we start to talk about negative resistance and, you know, Franklin oscillators and dynatrons and so on. Uh, this is the uh, radio handbook. You know, here's uh, Schrader. This is a classic electronic communications from the 70s. This is a, sort of a technician level book explaining circuits. A little more hands-on, a little more practical. I really like this book. It holds up over the long term. And it goes into Dynatron and Tunnel Diode Oscillators. So, um, this is a really nice uh, description. Let's take this thing apart and let's see what we're talking about here. How can we make an oscillator using negative resistance? In a normal linear system, as you increase voltage, the current through the device increases. This is the basis for 99% of all tube and transistor circuits. But there are some special devices and techniques that exist to make the linear curve turn on its head at some point in the load line. The first is a semiconductor material that has an early and then a late forward conduction zone with a region between that appears to backslide and go high Z zinc junctions and tunnel diodes and the unijunction transistor are examples but compound transistor arrangements can cleverly be constructed to do the same of course the vacuum tube was the first device that was perturbed into this behavior as early as 1915 at the dawn of the tetrode valve by cleverly biasing the screen higher than the anode or plate this guy confused the electrons so much that he got the effect he called it a dynatron. Another approach called the transitron was also developed and proven. These DC behaviors, while interesting to us, are only actually important when we consider AC operation. The entire discussion of a single port oscillator with a simple tuned circuit or crystal connected to a negative resistance device causing oscillation, that's the interesting part. Think of the negative resistance curve as causing the same effect as a switch or chopper. To oscillate, the diode's operating point must be in the middle of its negative resistance region, and the impedance of the tuned circuit must be greater than the negative resistance of the diode. So basically, we have a pulse of current that comes from the power supply on startup. As the current begins to flow through the diode into the tuned circuit's inductor, the voltage across the tunnel diode increases until it hits the negative resistance region of the curve. The inductor still has a positive voltage on it, which requires an increase in current, so it will not allow the tunnel diode to enter the negative resistance region. The circuit current rises immediately towards the constant value whose value is determined by the value of the resistor and the diode's resistance. 
However, as the voltage drop across the tunnel diode, VD, exceeds the peak point voltage, V sub P, the tunnel diode is driven into the negative resistance region. In this region, the current starts decreasing till the voltage VD becomes equal to the valley point voltage, or V sub V. At this point, a further increase in the voltage VD drives the diode into the positive resistance region. As a result of this, the circuit current tends to increase. This increase in current will increase the voltage drop across the resistor R, which will reduce the voltage VD. And the cycle then repeats, always pulling current from the DC supply. So whatever the device, it's basically a chopper exciting a tuned circuit if you stay centered in that negative resistance region. So what about the Franklin oscillator? You may have read in some texts that the Franklin oscillator is a negative resistance oscillator. In others, it's simply described as a 360 degree feedback oscillator lightly coupled to a resonator. Both are actually true. It's because of its strange topology and ability to work with a tuned circuit referenced to ground, it's known as a single port device, that it gets lumped in with this class. Q multipliers also get lumped in. So when we're talking about normal feedback oscillators, in order to secure oscillations in a circuit associated with a triode device, that could be a valve, transistor, or FET, it's necessary to feed back from the anode, collector, or drain a potential that's in phase with the grid, base, or gate voltage. And since these potentials are normally in opposite phase, some external means must be found of securing the additional phase reversal in the feedback path. In most single device oscillators, this is achieved by a second winding, a tap point on the coil, um, perhaps a feedback or tickler coil. A second device may be used, however, to obtain this phase reversal, and the result is known as the multivibrator oscillator. You have two stages. The first stage gives you 180, the second stage gives you 180, thus you get 360 degrees, positive feedback, and no external phase reversal coil or capacitor system is necessary. The oscillation is secured by coupling straight back uh, from the resonator back into the input. One form of this is the Franklin oscillator. So it can be said that an amplifier that has its input connected to its output in phase could be used to put power back into a tank and sustain oscillations. Now our Franklin does not rely on coil tapping or tickler feedback or capacitor splitting to flip the phase back to 360. It uses a second inverting stage and has a lot of cascade gain. This allows us to be very loosely coupled to the tuned element. So in review, it's certainly not going to be what we ordinarily think of as a negative resistance device like a tunnel diode or dynatron or strangely biased tetrode circuit. However, it can be shown mathematically that with a feedback oscillator like the Franklin, the effect is essentially the same. Okay, Mike, I'm really confused. Um, probably you should be asking why the Franklin is considered a negative resistance device. The answer is because it's really not a negative resistance device. It's a circuit that produces negative resistance from feedback. So in addition to the passive devices with the intrinsic negative resistance that we've been discussing, circuits with amplifying devices like transistors or op amps or tubes can present negative resistance at their ports. In circuit theory, we, we call these active resistors. Applying a voltage across the terminals causes a proportional current out of the positive terminal, the opposite of an ordinary resistor. For example, if we connected a battery to the terminals, it would cause the battery to charge rather than di discharge. Connecting a tuned circuit to it would cause an injection of current rather than loading it. Thus, we have the Q multiplication effect by employing feedback amplifiers. The amount of negative resistance can be varied simply by adjusting the loop gain. If an LC circuit is connected across the input of a positive feedback amplifier, like above, the negative differential input resistance can cancel the positive loss resistance 
inherent in the tuned circuit. That's it. That's the Q multiplier. So uh, I think you guys are uh, filled with enough theory now that we can move on to part two. I hope you guys stick around for part two where we actually build the Franklin oscillator. Um, this oscillator is going to change your mind about VFOs.